It's looking at the first derivative test and using that to help us find where our function is increasing and decreasing and where we might have some local maximum and local minimum values. And so let's look at a couple more examples and then we'll move on to some new stuff. And so our first example, we have g of x equals x squared times the square root of five minus x. Okay, so we need to figure out what the derivative of this function is. And we can figure out the derivative. We're gonna to need to use our chain rule and the product rule. So let's first rewrite this a little bit. So we're given that, oops, let me blow this up maybe. We're given that g of x is equal to x squared times, we can rewrite the square root of five minus x as five minus x, and that quantity raised to the one half power. So the first derivative test says that we want to find our derivative of our function and find out when that is equal to zero and where it's undefined. Okay, so looking at this using my product rule says, take the derivative of the first function, which is two x times the second function, which is five minus x raised to the one half, plus my first function, x squared, times the derivative of my second function, which I'm gonna to need to use the chain rule. Bringing our power down front, we have one half of the inside, five minus x, subtract one from my exponent of one half. So one half minus two halves is negative one half. And then we can't forget to take the derivative of the inside. And so the derivative of negative x gives us back negative one. Okay, so we need to figure out when this is equal to zero. So let's clean this up a little bit. We have two x all times the square root of five minus x plus, actually not plus, because of this minus over here, we have minus. So in our numerator, we just have an x squared all over two, and let's bring that five minus x raised to the negative one half power down to the denominator to make that exponent positive, and we can rewrite it as this square root of five minus x. So we wanna find out when this is equal to zero. So let's actually get a common denominator and rewrite this. And so I see my least common denominator is this two square roots of five minus x. So we're gonna to need to multiply that. Let's just move some room. This first grouping by a fancy one, our LCD over our LCD. So two square roots of five minus x all over two square roots of five minus x. Okay, so in our numerator, we have a two times our two, that's a four x, and then square root of five minus x times square root of five minus x, that gives us five minus x, and put that in parentheses, all over our LCD, two square roots of five minus x, and then minus this x squared. So if we distribute our 4x to each term in our parentheses, we get 20x minus 4x squared minus x squared all over two square roots of five minus x. So notice that we can combine like terms in our numerator. So we have 20x, we have a negative 4x squared minus a 1x squared. So that's a minus five x squared all over two square roots of five minus x. So let's factor out a five x in our numerator. So factoring out a five x from our numerator, we're left with four minus x 
all over two square roots of five minus six. So we're trying to find out when is our derivative equal to zero? Well, if we multiply both sides by our denominator, really we're only curious when is our numerator equal to zero? So when is five X times the quantity four minus X equal to zero? So that's gonna be when X is equal to zero and when X is equal to four. So we wanna find values where our derivative is undefined, but defined in our original function. Our original function notice has that radical. And so we have to limit our domain for our original function, right? Because whatever is underneath that square root has to be greater than or equal to zero. And so in our original function, five minus X has to be greater than or equal to zero. Or if I add X to both sides, X has to be less than or equal to five. The problem is in our denominator over here for our derivative, notice that five when X is five sets that denominator equal to zero. So it's undefined at X equals five. But notice that's okay for our original for X to be five. Okay, so we have three critical values and we wanna test on each side of our critical values to see if our derivative is positive. And if so, it's increasing or if it's negative, plugging it back into the derivative, we know the function is decreasing in that interval. So I normally put these on the number line. And so we have zero, we have four, and we have some five. So I notice I have one, two, three, four intervals that I have to test. So choose something less than zero. So how about negative one? We're plugging it back into the original function, wherever we see, not the original, the derivative function, wherever we see an X. So again, like we were talking about yesterday, we really don't care what the number is that we get back when we're checking the derivative. We're just caring is it positive or negative. And so if you want to, you can just kind of think about signs. If I plugged in negative one, wherever I saw an X here, I would get negative five. So that's a negative number. All times, if I plug in negative one here, right? Four minus a negative one is five. That's a positive number. All over, well, we have numbers that we chose. Um, zero and four is in our domain. That probably should check that too. But anyways, um, so we our denominator is always gonna be positive, right? because whatever number we plug in for our square root, that's a positive number times two, so positive. So this number, when I plug in negative one into my derivative function is less than zero. So this tells me if my function is decreasing from negative infinity to zero. So now choose a number that is in between zero and four. So if we chose, how about x equals one? And we plug it back into our derivative function. Well, this five times one is positive. All over four minus one is positive. All over denominator is always positive. So multiplying positive times positive all over positive. We got something greater than zero. So our function is increasing here. Choose something between four and five. So how about 4.5? So plugging it into the derivative function. Well, 4.5 times that five, that's positive. 4 minus 4.5 though is negative all over a positive number. This is less than zero. So this would be decreasing. One more number to test. So how about X equals six? It has to be bigger than five. So X equals six. 
plugging it into the derivative function. So here we have this five times six is positive. Four minus six, so four minus six is negative all over something that's positive. So notice that this derivative function evaluated at six is less than zero. So we know that this is also decreasing. Wait, but five minus six is negative and the square root of a negative is undefined. Ah, uh, but when we, oops, you're right. Yay, yay, yay. Great job. So notice exactly what Ella was talking about. We had to talk about our function. The domain was x is less than or equal to 5. And so this falls outside of our domain. of g of x. And if I actually had plugged that in wherever I saw an x, I would have noticed that negative underneath the radical. OK, so that actually is undefined. And so there we go. OK, so looking at this now, we know where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. And so part of the question wants to know where is our function increasing? And so we're looking at our intervals where it's increasing, that's just from 0 to 4. Where it's decreasing, you have two separate places, from negative infinity to 0, union 4 to 5. So let's say we wanted to find the maximum where the maximum um, point was. How about I state it this way? So find the point where local max and mins occur. So notice that from negative infinity to zero, it's decreasing, and then we're increasing. So we can see that x equals zero is a minimum point. So a min occurs at x equals zero. So to figure out what that minimum value is, though, we're going to need to plug it into our original function of g of x. And so we have g of 0, which gives us 0 squared, all times the square root of 5 minus 0. And so we get that this is just equal to 0. So the minimum occurs at x equals 0 is a value of 0, but the point is 0, 0. So from 0 to 4, we're increasing. And then 4 to 5, we decrease. And so I can see that at x equals 4, we're going to have some maximum value. So a max occurs at x equals 4. And we can figure out what g of 4 is to figure out what that point is and what the maximum value is. So we have 5 times 4 square root of 5 minus 4. Well, 5 times 4 is 20. 5 minus 4 underneath the radical is 1, and square root of 1 is 1. So we don't need to write that. So this point where the maximum occurs is 420. Okay. What if we wanted to know, though, about absolute maximums and absolute minimums? Are there any absolute max and absolute mins?
Wait, wouldn't it be 16, not 20? It was four squared, not... Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know where I got that five from. Or maybe from up here when we were doing that multiplication. Um, you're right. Okay, so we were squaring our four in front. So right, that's 16. Okay, so extreme value theorem holds here. And the fact that we have a bounded um, inequality, everything is less than in our domain, equal to five. I know that my g of x function, x squared is always, it's continuous and that square root of five minus x is always continuous for x less than or equal to five. And so an absolute max and an absolute min, min might occur. Um, it could occur though at that end value. So we want to see what is g of five. So if we go back in and plug in five, I see that's zero. We get g of five is equal to five squared, all times the square root, right, of five minus five. So this is 25 times zero, which is zero. Let's look at the limit as x is going off to negative infinity of g of x. To see is that graph is our end behavior shooting up, going to positive infinity, as our shooting down, going to negative infinity. So let's look at the limit here as x is approaching negative infinity of x squared all over the square root of five minus x. Well, let's think about it logically. If we plug in negative infinity wherever we see an x in there, if I square my negative infinity, right? Five minus a negative infinity. Well, negative infinity quantity squared is positive infinity and five plus infinity underneath the radical that's still shooting up to infinity. So I can see a positive growing really large times a positive growing really large is um, going really large. It's going off to infinity. And so my end behavior is X is going off to negative infinity. That's shooting upwards going to positive infinity. So it looks like I do not have an absolute max. But we do have an absolute minimum. So recall, we had a point where a minimum was zero, zero. And then that inbound of our domain, and when x equals five, we also got a zero. So we actually have two absolute mins because we got the same y value, the smallest y value. So we have an absolute minimum at the points zero, zero and five, zero. So that was an example that kind of pulled in a lot of what we were, we've studied so far from this chapter, but also a lot of other stuff that we pulled just through the whole semester, right? Looking at limits as X is going to infinity or negative infinity, looking at max and mins, finding derivatives, using the product rule. So we have f of x is equal to x cubed, and that's all divided by 3x squared plus 1. 
So we're going to answer the questions, where is our function f of x increasing? Where is it decreasing? Does it have any local max, local min, any absolute max, absolute mins? If I look at this and I first look at my domain of f of x, I would look at, our, do I have any trouble spots? And the only trouble spots I would have would be values which set my denominator equals to zero. And looking at this, there's no real number which sets my denominator equal to zero. So my domain for my original function is negative infinity to infinity. So now let's look at the derivative of this function and we need to use the quotient rule. So we're looking at the derivative of our numerator, which is 3x squared times our denominator, 3x squared plus one, minus our numerator, x cubed, times the derivative of our denominator, which is 6x, all over this denominator, 3x squared plus one, quantity squared. So let's simplify our new, uh, let's see. I'm thinking actually it might be easier if we factor before we distribute. Notice that both of these groupings in our numerator, we can factor out in x squared, right? If we pull it out in x squared, that would mean I have a three here times this parentheses, three x squared plus one minus, if I pulled out an x squared from x cubed, we're left with a single x times this 6x, all over our denominator, 3x squared plus 1, quantity squared. So let's distribute in our bracket and combine like terms. So distributing our 3 to 3x squared plus 1, we would get 9x squared plus 3 minus x times 6x, so 6x squared. All over our denominator, 3x squared plus 1 quantity squared. So we have a 9x squared minus a 6x squared is a 3x squared plus 3 all over 3x squared plus 1. I see I can pull a 3 out of that factor in the numerator. And if I do that, I would have a 3x squared all times x squared plus 1 all over, I was thinking, and it didn't. 3x squared plus 1. I really didn't need to pull it out. It doesn't hurt. I was thinking for some reason it was going to affect or cancel in the denominator, which it doesn't. Um, so we have the derivative of f of x equals this. So we're looking at when is our derivative equal to 0 and where is it undefined? Well, 3x squared plus 1, that denominator is always defined for all values of x, so there's nothing we have to exclude there. And looking at when our derivative is equal to zero, we're just looking really when is our numerator equal to zero? When is 3x squared all times x squared plus one equal to zero? Well, that's when 3x squared equals zero or x is zero. x squared plus one equal to zero, that's just an imaginary number. That's plus or minus i. Imaginary numbers aren't critical numbers, so we would just ignore that. So the only real number that sets our, our derivative equal to zero is zero, which makes it really nice because we only have to test two intervals. So choose something which is less than zero. How about x equals negative one? If we go in and we plug in negative one, Wherever we see an x in our original function, not original, the derivative, we'll notice that all those values of x's are squared. 
So if I plug in a negative number and I square it, it's positive. And so I notice that this three times negative one quantity squared is positive. And so I have a positive times a positive all over a positive. So I see that this is greater than zero. And so my function is increasing here. Same sort of reasoning that I just told you. I notice that all the values of x are squared. And if I plug in one in there and we're summing things, not subtracting anything, it is also going to be greater than zero. So what's happening here? Notice it's defined at x equals zero for our original. It's not defined for our original, our derivative function, or it's, that's where it's equal to zero. So really what's happening there, it's a continuous function, but you're going to have some sharp peak. It's going to be a sharp corner, and we know it's not differentiable at, at sharp corners. And so we can say, really, it, it's increasing. It's defined again at zero. So I can say it's increasing. It's from negative infinity to infinity. So that means it's not decreasing anywhere. Um, looking at this, if I'm strictly increasing always, I'm not going to have any, um, in this case, max or mins. And if there's no local max to local min, there's not going to be any, uh, not necessary. If there's no, there's no absolute max and no absolute min. 